You ever gone back and look at some of your photos when you first got into photography? So this is my 2017 computer. I purchased it a couple years ago, brand new, and I bought it mainly for video work for this channel, but I ended up using this as my main machine for everything. I edit all my photos, video, do all my work on this computer, which ultimately left my 2015 iMac behind me just kind of off on the sidelines. I very rarely ever use it anymore. But a couple days ago, I needed to get a file off of the computer. I don't even recall exactly what it was. But um, I knocked the dust off the computer, the old iMac. I logged into it. I got the file I was looking for, but I found a folder, most importantly, titled 2015-2016 Favorites. And inside of this folder were my favorite images from when I first got into landscape photography or when, when I first got uh, real serious about it. And I spent the next probably 15, 20 minutes reviewing these images, and it, it was absolutely fantastic. Half of these photos I completely forgot I ever even captured. And as I was going through them, I kind of noticed um, a lot of different things, but I noticed the same kind of reoccurring issues over and over and over. And they were all compositional mistakes, but I made them just constantly over and over again. And then I would start to solve for those issues a little bit. And I could see that my progression got a little bit better. And that's the purpose of this week's video is to discuss three compositional mistakes that really every landscape photographer should avoid. And if you've never gone through that exercise where you go back and look at some of your early images, I highly recommend that. There is no better way to make yourself feel better about your progression than looking at what you were creating a few years ago compared with what you're creating right now. So I highly recommend that. But to jump right into it, the very first compositional mistake that I saw repeatedly is something that I call shooting high and wide. And there's two parts of this, the high and the wide part, but this is something that I saw happening constantly in all of these photographs. And I kind of put them in chronological order from my earliest photos to my uh, more recent ones in 2016. And here's a great example of it right here. So I was, I was going through these photos and I noticed that they all were kind of, they were all taken at eye level. None of these were really close to the ground at all. None of these were crouched down a little bit. I remember taking them all as I start to review these photographs, but they were all taken at eye level. And, I, and that made sense for me back at the, you know, in that time. I don't have the best back. I know I mentioned that before in a, in a video. I had an old injury that I never act, never properly had taken care of. And it's, I just kind of have like daily lingering pain a little bit. But I remember when I would get on location, I would simply take my tripod up as high as I could possibly get it to try and get my camera as close to my eye as I could so I didn't have to hunch out over so I was more comfortable. And sometimes a composition is best shot at eye level, but a lot of times there's a much better way to shoot that composition. Maybe it's all the way down on the ground. Maybe it's just crouched down a little bit. Maybe it's from a perspective above eye level. But I noticed there was very little variety in my portfolio back then. Everything was shot at eye level. But then something changed, and I found this photo right here. And you'll have to excuse the edit on here. I have no idea what I was thinking. But I like this photo, and it's a good example of, uh, and it's the earliest example that I could find, of me starting to get a little bit lower. And I got down in this area right here, and I think this it makes this image a little bit more interesting. The edit on it probably actually ruins it, but this is an example of me getting actually lower. And I'm not sure if somebody told me to, to stop shooting everything at eye level, or maybe I read something or watched a video, but I started to find more images like this. Here's another example right here, and I, I really do like this photo, where I actually just got a little bit lower, and I think it made this image much more interesting. I wish I would have gotten even lower and captured more of these uh, fallen leaves in the foreground, but this is an example of me starting to get a little bit lower. It's also funny to look through your old images. I always used to put this white border around a lot of my, my favorite photos. And it's always funny to, to look at your old watermarks as well. I don't know if you can see this, but I have something here that says, making the ordinary extraordinary, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. I completely forgot about that. But here's another example, and this is probably one of my favorite photos from that folder. But And I remember when I captured this as well, just getting as low as I could to this marshy area. And I think that's what really makes this photo uh, interesting. It's just the, the dimension in, of the uh, the foreground right through here. I really like that. In this water right here, I remember getting as as low as I could without getting my water wet, or getting my water wet, getting my camera wet. But I think when I started to do that, that was when my composition started to get a little bit better. Now, the second part of shooting high and wide is the wide part. And as you, as I went through a lot of these photos, you'll notice that every single one of these photographs is shot in a landscape orientation. 
there's nothing in a portrait orientation. And when you shoot in a portrait orientation, especially with landscapes, you are naturally gonna capture more foreground. And if you combine that with actually getting a little bit lower, so not shooting at eye level, that's a perfect recipe of getting very detailed and powerful foreground images or foreground uh, elements in your images that are gonna create additional depth. And once I started to do that, and this is an example right here, this is just your, your standard kind of ocean scene shot in landscape orientation. But then when I flipped it to portrait, I would say I came up with that. And this is a much more powerful image than this right here. Actually, I, I really do like the simplicity of this photo. You have a nice foreground, in, nice clean foreground area. You got nice blue water in the midground and this ominous sky in the background right here. And it really creates these, these layers in this photograph and it really makes it what it is and is much better than that right there. But I noticed I started to do this more often. Got very low to the ground right here to this puddle to try and get some type of a reflection. It's not the most interesting reflection, but shooting in portrait orientation and get a little bit lower to the ground makes this image much more interesting and creates a lot more depth. Here's another image right here. I don't love this composition, but I did get down into this kind of field of wheat and I was able to get this sun kind of just uh, kissing a little bit of the, the top of the, the wheat right here. I think this is wheat, but I think this is the most interesting part of the photograph because I shot in a portrait orientation and I got low to the ground. Here's another example of a, a lone crane in, uh, in the Florida Keys. And I really like, got a little bit of reflection right here. And of course you have uh, the, the bird in the foreground and you got these bushes kind of in the, in the mid ground area and you got the colorful sky in the background as well. So just shooting in a portrait orientation and getting a little bit wider, or sorry, getting a little bit lower to the ground really enhanced my compositions. And I think that was probably a big step forward in my photography back then. Now, the second kind of mistake that I saw repeatedly is something that I call busy edges. And there's two parts to this one as well. And here's a great example of just placing elements in your scene way too close to the edge. And this is actually one of my most popular images when I first uh, got into landscape photography. And this is actually me standing right here. I put my camera on a 10 second timer and ran over there and captured this photo. But this is a train station in my, uh, in my hometown. But I placed the awning of this train station just way too close to the edge of this, uh, to the edge of the frame. Here's another example right here where this tree is just way too close to the edge. And uh, this is a golf, uh, a golf course, uh, not too far from my house, but I put this T marker right here. It's actually touching the edge of the frame as well, but just paying attention to where I'm putting elements of my scene and trying to keep them away from the edges a little bit, or if it's gotta be close to the side, at least giving it a little bit of room to breathe. Because the way that I think of edges is, I try and keep the edges of my photos as clean as possible because I want the viewer's eye to be directed towards the center part of my photograph. I don't really want them to, to be looking at the edges of the photo because I think that if their eye starts to wander towards the edge of your photograph, there's a higher likelihood that they're about to leave your photo and stop looking at it and go look at something else or go do something else. And that's obviously not what you're intending to do. You wanna keep the viewer looking at your photograph as long as possible. So I think having very clean edges is a great way to do that. Now the second part of this has to do with leaving those kind of half in, half out items. And I did this constantly. Almost every one of those images has this in it somewhere, but I cut off this bush right here, which would have been great to leave the entire um, plant in here because it would have balanced this image out a little bit. But I cut off these rocks right here. I even cut off the sailboat in the background. Here's another example right here where I cut off half of this tree. I should have just either rotated my composition just a little bit more to the right and capture this entire tree or rotated it a little bit more to the left and cut out these two trees. But just being very cognizant of what you have on the edges of your frames is, is a very good best practice to get into. Here's another example here. I love this photograph and I completely forgot I ever captured it. But this, this man walking on this uh, foggy morning and I left this area right here. And it, it, it definitely, my eye is gravitated to this every time I look at this photograph. I wish I would have placed this guy walking more in this area right here in the third area. And then just kind of by rotating my composition more to the left. And I wish I would have captured more of this tree because it's one of the, the whole half in half out thing. 
sometimes it's okay to have things sticking in your frame a little bit, but have a, a lot of it. Don't just have just like a little sliver of it sticking in your, in your frame. If you're gonna have anything sticking in your frame, have a lot of it. So if you can't include an entire tree, maybe include half of the tree, but don't just have like a couple branches sticking in because that kind of looks a little bit sloppy. And it looks sloppy in this image as well too. It looks like I just completely missed it. Well, I, I did completely miss it. But, and, and here's another example right here where I completely cut off the tops of these sailboats. I even cut off the bottom part of this dock and it's kind of like a little boathouse right here. So just being very aware of what is along the edges of your photograph. And when I'm on location, that's something, when I remember I'm framing up a shot, I pay, extra critical attention to the edges of my scene to, to make sure that I don't have anything sticking in that I don't want to, or I'm making sure there's no elements of my scene that are just kind of creeping too close to the edges and trying to give those types of things a little bit of room to breathe if I have to place it near, near the edge of a photo. Now, the third mistake that I saw throughout this uh, entire experiment is something that I call kind of sloppy horizons or, or, or bad horizons. And there's two parts to um, bad horizons as well. And the first part has to do with this. And and it, it's really just kind of being aware where you're putting your horizon line. So in this situation right here, there's not a lot going on in the sky. And frankly, there's a not, not a lot going on in the foreground either. But most of the time, you're not going to run into a scenario where your, your sky is very interesting and your foreground is very interesting. A lot of times, it's kind of one or the other. Sometimes you'll, you'll, you're lucky enough to get both. But in this situation, the foreground is a little bit more interesting than the sky. I like the, uh, the shadow kind of leading out to the end of the pier right here. So if I could recompose this now, I would probably do something kind of like that and just focus more on this shadow leading out here to the end of the pier. I think the water is a little bit more interesting than the sky is. Neither one is super interesting, but I think the shadow really adds to the overall photograph. And I think it looks a little bit better than that. So if your foreground is more interesting than your, than your uh, sky, I would probably put your horizon a little bit higher in your frame so you could focus on more of the foreground. And if your sky is more interesting than your foreground, I would probably put the horizon a little bit lower in your frame so you're focusing on more of the sky. But just being aware of where you're putting your foreground is, is, is a good best practice to get into. Here's another example right here. I shot this with a drone and I really wish I would have included either quite a bit more of the sky or just completely cut out the sky altogether. And if I were to, to recrop it now, I'd probably cut out the sky. But just leaving a tiny little strip up here really doesn't add anything to the photograph. It really just serves as a, a distraction, honestly. Now, the, the second part of this one really has to do with, and this is very common, especially when you're first getting into photography, it has to do with uh, just sloping or crooked horizons. And I didn't have a lot of those, but I did have a couple that were just, just barely crooked. And I know sometimes it's hard to get a horizon perfectly level when you're on location, but when you have the your file in post, just giving it that little bit of extra attention or love to try and get that horizon absolutely perfect is, is, is a good good habit to get into. And for this one right here, I think this pier kind of messed with me a little bit. It looks almost like an optical illusion, but this image is definitely kind of sloping in this direction. This side is a little bit lower than the right side. Here's another example here as well, where the left side is just a touch lower than the right side, but nothing can ruin a photograph quicker than a crooked horizon. So just making sure that those are uh, as straight as you can possibly get it is a good best practice to get into as well. So those are the three compositional mistakes that I, uh, I, I solved just over and over and over again from my portfolio from when I first got into photography. So I hope you were able to, to get something out of this week's video that you could possibly apply to your photography moving forward as well. And if you haven't gone through that exercise of going back and looking at your, your images from the past, and comparing them to your images from the present, I highly re recommend that. It's a great way to uh, identify where you're progressing or where you would like to progress a little bit more. So if you enjoyed this week's video, if you could give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And as always, I really do appreciate you watching this week's video and I'll see you next week. Bye.